Good morning and welcome to DTV. My name is Avery Lightford. I'm the Chief Customer Officer here at InfoStretch. I'm really delighted to welcome Kirk, uh, Kirk Bourne to DTV. Kirk is the first Data Science Fellow uh, and Executive Advisor to Booz Allen. Uh, he is re consistently recognized as one of the top influencers in the field of big data. He has a really distinguished career, starting with a PhD from Caltech, work as an astrophysicist at NASA, where obviously if you talk about big data, that is the home of big data. Uh, so Kirk, talk a little bit about how you end up going from the, the world, of, uh, world of NASA to the modern world of data science and big data. Thank you for having me. It's uh, really great to be here. And uh, that journey is uh, actually a, a much more continuous and smooth than one might think. Uh, because as an astrophysicist or any kind of scientist, you're always working with data. Uh, in my particular case, uh, since I was an astronomer, I, and I always tell people I was doing data as my night job. Uh, my 20 years at NASA, I was doing data as my day job, that as uh, supporting uh, space astronomy data systems for NASA space astronomy mission. So what happened? I mean, as, which things, what principles have stayed the same as you've made that? And which things have you seen become really different as you've moved into the into kind of more modern, you know, the current world of data science? Well, currently the biggest difference is just the ubiquity of it. That is, it's everywhere, right? It's not just in the sciences or, or in engineering or in healthcare and sort of the obvious places you would imagine. There's always been information and data streams, but uh, now it's essentially everywhere. So, you know, so the internet had a lot to do with that. Smartphones had much more to do with that. Yeah. The apps we have all generate data, use data, create data. So, uh, so, so those are the really big differences, but, the, but in, in a sense, the similarities are also pretty strong. And that is you're really just, it's really just about finding patterns in data, you know, finding uh, anomalies, you know, clusters, correlations, uh, different patterns that uh, represent certain things you're trying to diagnose or predict, you know, so we call those supervised learning, uh, okay. defining different, uh, you know, unusual patterns in your data that you uh, try to figure out what they mean, that's unsupervised learning. So all that stuff is really the same across any discipline. So that's, for me, I find this the easiest way to explain myself to people when I speak at conferences and they say, who's this astrophysicist talking to us? And I might be at a medical conference or an electricity conference or a cybersecurity conference. And you know, by the time I get through talking about this whole concept of, of using uh, data to represent some thing that moves through space and time, whether it's a customer or a cyber actor or a product or a machine or a killer asteroid, it's really pretty much all the same sort of analytic process. Interesting. And then, you know, as people are trying to build these data science teams, uh, there aren't an infinite number of NASA astrophysicists uh, to, to harvest, so to speak, or to, or to lure. So how do people build these data science teams? And what is your advice for, you know, what are the disciplines that lead you in? And or if you come from a certain area, how do you get into this field? Because it's, it's booming. Yeah, it's really uh, very multi multifaceted now. There's really many paths to this. Uh, years ago, there weren't so many paths. So most of the people I met at conferences, when I started doing more data science, machine learning stuff in the early days, when I say early days, after my 20 years of doing traditional astrophysics, it, then about 20 years ago, I started moving into this machine learning thing. Most of the people at those conferences were computer scientists, right? So people who were already doing coding, algorithms and data structures and that stuff. Uh, so, so some of the harvest of, of data scientists comes from the science disciplines like myself who, who have done work with data always from the computer science community. But uh, what's happened in recent years is this, this, this sort of like a growing infatuation with everyone with data and discovery from data, patterns in data, and, and the cool things you can do with machine learning algorithms. So a whole new generation of, of young and old <laughs> People are getting uh, uh, attracted to this. I, I, call, I call it a gateway drug to STEM education. We're finding students really getting attracted to science and math like they never have before when they see the cool things they can do with that telephone in their hands. They all have the smartphone in hand. And I always would tell my students, you're generating data that other companies are using to uh, create value and products and make money off of you. Why, why don't you do that? Right. And so people come in it from uh, all kinds of different uh, avenues. and. Uh, the interesting thing about that is, uh, as a consequence of this, that when we when we started the world's first data science undergraduate degree program at George Mason University 12 years ago, we, we were the only one in the world. Now there's literally hundreds 
in the United States alone and thousands worldwide. And, and, and each, every time a new program opens, literally they have to turn students away because there's hundreds of uh, thousands of applicants. But even in all of that exponential growth of talent, the number of opportunities in business is growing at a faster exponential which means basically the, the gap is still growing exponentially because of, the, because of much faster growth on the demand side from the businesses and organizations than from the supply side, despite the enormous growth on both sides. So what's your advice to com companies that are trying to build one? I mean, if they're facing all of this, how do they recruit? Is there a way to focus or craft uh, the job role um, to get the right kind of people or to, or to attract the right kind of people? Well, getting the uh, the seed, so to speak, to, to start a team is probably going to be the hardest thing, right? Getting the sort of the, the, the person who really is the expert and all this stuff who's going to uh, grow the team around him or her. Then you can bring in people either through the normal recruitment process or you can start uh, building up people internally. So one of the things my company does at Booz Allen, Hamilton, we do a lot of external hiring. Uh, we have 2,000 data scientists now, and our goal is to have 5,000 within the next three years. We know there's no way we're going to hire those people, so we do upskilling and reskilling of our existing people. And the advantage of that is these two, these people who already work in your business, they already know your business use cases, they know your domain, they know your clients, they know your data. They, they, I mean, they know all the stuff that a newborn data scientist that you hire out of college won't know. So maybe that newborn data scientist coming out of college now may be smarter in terms of their coding skills or machine learning skills, but they're not going to know the business. And, and people say that the hardest thing is to train someone, a data scientist in domain knowledge than the other way around. It's easier to upskill someone who has domain knowledge in these uh, harder skills. So businesses are discovering, yeah, I can do that. I can uh, help people in my organization now who are already working maybe as a data analyst or a database engineer or anything for that matter. I mean, we've, we've discovered that some companies say their best data scientist was person like a philosophy major or an art major, because mm -hmm. that's the, the kind of person who has that creativity and curiosity that you really need on a data science team. So that when it comes right down to it, the, the one fundamental thing that person that you need to find is a person who wants to be a lifelong learner. Yeah, uh, continuous learning is essential in this field because it's changing so dramatically. And so you could you could take any person off the street who's willing to learn new things and and has you know sort of computational or communication or collaboration types of aptitudes already and you know, you know, make them uh, pretty successful data scientists. Well, good. This has really been this has been really insightful and uh, appreciate it. Any parting comments you'd want to make to the, to the viewers about things they should be thinking about that they might not be at top of mind for them? Say that, I, I say the two most important things in data science are the data and the science. <laughs> yeah. Because the data is the fuel, the objective evidence, the objective information uh, that sort of fuels uh, our uh, sort of knowledge discovery and, pat and uh, pattern detection and decision making and action taking. And science is the process, okay? Science is a procedure, a process. So data science, some people like to say data science is coding or data science is machine learning, but it's really a process where you apply coding and machine learning. However, and that process is, is an iterative process where you fail fast to learn fast, right? Yeah. You build something, and this all goes back to this sort of agile concept that we've been talking about in computer software development for decades, right? Uh, De DevOps, agile. Same thing applies in data science and, and to science in general. That is, you develop a hypothesis from your data, whether you're an astrophysicist looking at black holes in deep space or you're looking at your customer data. You develop a hypothesis from the data. You run an experiment to see if your hypothesis makes sense. And, and, and probably the initial one is not all there and not completely correct. And so you iterate. You, you, you uh, refine the hypothesis and try again. And so the scientific process helps you to get there. And so we call that fail fast to learn fast. You know, so not failure for uh, strategic regions, but, but failing for tactical reasons, you know, finding the failure modes so that you avoid them in the future. Just like Thomas Edison 
said in response to someone who complained that he had failed a thousand times to invent the light bulb. And he said, no, I didn't. I learned a thousand ways not to invent the light bulb. So, so the learning is, is brilliant because that's what humans do. Humans learn ever since birth. And so we love to learn. Machines love to learn. Let's put those, those two loves together. Well, look, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate the time. And I uh, want to say, uh, in general, if you're uh, passionate about digital transformation and want to come on the show, uh, please email us at dtv at infostretch.com. We'd love to have you on. Uh, thank you, and uh, see you next time. I want my DTV!